everyone. You're watching another episode of the Care Minds podcast. I'm your host, Daniel. Today's guest is Laura Furman. Laura is a senior product manager at Aura Ring, a neat little uh, smart ring device that connects to your app. In today's conversation with Laura, we're exploring topics of breaking into product development in health tech, AI and machine learning tools for discovery phase and product attribution, usage of AI and machine learning tools in Laura's day-to-day -day work as a product manager, team empowerment, and building strong teams for predictable product delivery. Hope you enjoy this one. Let's get started. Laura. Thank you very much for uh, joining this Care Minds podcast episode today. I'm um, very glad to have this conversation with you. Thanks for having me. At Care Minds, we regularly stress that there is no the right, there is no such thing as the right way to get into uh, product development in health tech, especially. And um, Laura's background showcases yet another way to get into it. And I think it's very important to highlights your kind of like background, especially referring to student agencies experience, uh, which kind of like gave uh, students the hands-on business ops uh, experience. And you were also involved in some of the activities that uh, are a part of day-to-day -day job of product manager. Um, so that being said, could one view that as a model of either getting into product development or uh, if that is too bold of a claim, uh, we can call it a first kind of like step into that direction. So please tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The sort of conventional wisdom is the longer you're working, the less important your sort of older experience is. Like, you know, take your high school off your resume, that kind of thing. But as I continue throughout my career, the student agency's experience is something that keeps coming back and keeps coming up as something that was really unique and an interesting foundation. So a little bit of background, uh, Student Agencies is a student-run corporation. It's a non-for-profit 501c3, and it's an educational institution aimed at giving students hands-on experience running a business. So this is when I was in college. It's a collection of uh, seven or eight businesses that all do different things, ranging from we had real estate property management to a business that helped tutor students to a a marketing business that made a local guide about restaurants to a, a shipping and storage company, a full service moving company. Like there were a lot of different um, entirely student run and student operated businesses that sort of collected into this one unit. And so I had the opportunity to work uh, as a general manager of one of the businesses for a year. And then in the second year, they take one student on to be the president of the whole corporation. So that experience was really incredible. It's not necessarily product management, but it's being an entrepreneur and owning something from end to end, seeing how everything interacts, being able to read a financial statement top to bottom. Uh, you know, EBITDA was thrown around a lot <laughs> back, back in those days. So uh, that was a really formative experience in getting to see how all the pieces interact um, and also getting really direct experience dealing with customers, like being on the other end of the phone when a parent is extremely upset because we misplaced their student's box from storage and now they don't have sheets for their bed. Like really being in the trenches of dealing with um, customers, I think was a super valuable experience. And then also uh, proposing a budget, asking for staffing. When I was president of student agencies, we created the first a CTO role. So I identified an opportunity as president of like, Cornell has this amazing engineering program. Why aren't we leveraging students from the engineering school in order to drive our businesses forward with um, better digital resources, databases, things like that. So uh, creating job descriptions, hiring, and then executing against a strategy. Um, the crazy thing about student agencies is, you know, there's continuity because there is a, um, CEO who's there year over year, who's an actual adult <laughs> who mm -hmm. has business experience and he's there to like mentor and make sure that the trains go, don't go off the tracks. He's mm -hmm. amazing. His name is Kyle. He's a really amazing mentor, still is. But, you know, it's not a sustainable business model to have the entire company turn over on an annual basis. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of interesting things around training and uh, recruiting that also go into being successful there. So really sort of end-to-end -end entrepreneurship experience, which translates well into being a product manager because you have to think about not just your 
pixels on the screen, but how it's going to fit into the entire business strategy. I think that you can pick up on that uh, thinking uh, either through learning experience or it it's given to you naturally, but definitely it helps when it comes to uh, getting your foot in the door of um, product management. And um, after that, your experiences with different e-commerce companies that you work with, can you please tell which type of skills you were focused on uh, when entering those companies and realizing that PM is the way to go and transitioning into that role? Uh, what kind of resources were available at that time? What did you do essentially? When I graduated college, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I went into the retail industry because there was a great opportunity to do a management rotational program with Gap. And essentially my thinking was retail is the foundation of all business. So I can't go wrong having a retail background if I want to do something else later down the line. I started off there, ended up doing e-commerce merchandising where I was essentially thinking about how the customer purchases things through the website. So their experience discovering, deciding if it's the right thing for them, going through the checkout, those kind of things. Um, and when I was there, I discovered a problem that was hurting one of the categories I was managing. Sub brands of Gap have buyers, some of them have digital merchandisers. It was all sort of different models, but basically you're really connected to driving, think of like finance, except on the level of every single SKU. So mm -hmm. figuring out how many units you're supposed to be selling of every single item per week and why that is or is not happening. And then mm -hmm. looking at trends over the whole assortment of things that are underperforming or overperforming to essentially analyze what's going on in the business. So that's sort of where my uh, love of data and analytics really took hold is thinking of um, driving forward the business on the level of a SKU. So that was uh, kind of the primary focus. And then looking at that against our site traffic data using mm -hmm. Omniture. So, uh, you know, traffic conversion rate, where are we seeing add to cart drop-offs? And then really I dug a lot into the search traffic because at that time we were really thinking as merchants of managing the taxonomy so that people could browse down to uh, find whatever items they were looking for. But I noticed an uptick of a lot of people coming in and actually just searching. And we weren't doing a lot to improve that search experience, whether it was the managing the naming conventions of the items or mm -hmm. having synonyms or putting in things so that people could find things more easily. So that's mainly what I was working on there. And then we, I discovered a problem in the experience for a particular category I was managing and was able to get buy-in to do a design sprint around that where I was the product owner because I was the category manager for that. And so we did a design sprint and that was the big light bulb week for me where I was like, what would be my job if this was my whole job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sort of the answer that came back from that was product management. And that's how I got curious about it. Started looking at what are the job descriptions for a product manager? What are the key skills? And I think a lot of people when they're transitioning have a hard time sort of filling the gap between where they are now and the skills they need to have as a product manager. I think you can do it either through projects in your existing role, taking on stretch projects. Like I did a lot of stuff around search and SEO in order to sort of fill a, a gap in my resume and then also by doing side projects. But I don't think you necessarily need, like I have checked off every single skill a hundred percent. Like mm. when I applied for my first product roles, I would say I had, you know, 60, 70% of the skills checked off, but was able to make a strong case as to different experience I brought to the table. So what ended up happening there was Drew, really amazing manager. He was at Mercari. He reached out to me. We didn't know each other at the time. Uh, he reached out to me for hiring a category manager role, which was what I was currently doing. I saw that he was a director of product with like 15 years of experience, Google, Walmart, like really mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that Mercari had open product manager roles. And I said, hey, I know you're recruiting me for this. Would you actually consider me for product management? And he said, oh, that's interesting. What do you think a product manager does? And, you know, long story short, they ended up hiring me. So that was a really uh, amazing opportunity and a great testament to Mercari's, you know, hiring for potential versus hiring for fitting uh, exact list of skills. 
very interesting hiring for potential and also uh, being able to uh, see the problems from the amounts of data that you're working with and come up with solution and action plans. As a follow-up question, if you could go back and answer that same question, what does a product manager do now that you have experience working at Aura? I don't know if I would answer it better now. I think the first thing I talked about was focus on advocating for the customer. It was the same thing being in merchandising where you were sort of the voice of the customer and managing the business expectation versus the customer need. So really getting a clear picture of what they want, not only from user things like talking to customers, but also looking at the data. I think customer is number one. Number two is being able to develop a strategy and then bring people on board and convince them. So a thing that I did a lot in my sort of education is debate and negotiation is really a strong background in what I studied in school. So I can convince people of things, whether it's the right thing or not, is I need to be really sure. So uh, I'm good at kind of seeing both sides of an argument and figuring out what I truly think and then bringing people along in that sort of journey. Um, And then I think the last thing I said was the ability to quickly learn and iterate. I know as we develop, like we don't want to have this sort of big monolithic two-year-long roadmap to making a product without having these gateposts of how we learn and iterate along the way. So that was sort of my philosophy. And I think that fit really well with the culture of Mercari, which is very A-B testing focused and analytical. That makes sense. Thanks. That's a pretty interesting insights. And what kind of resources were available to you when it comes to picking up the product management acumen and maybe something that you've stumbled across uh, recently and thought to yourself that would have been a good opportunity for you when you were learning these skills? The way I sort of approached learning and development when I started at Mercari was each quarter was a different focus area. So the first quarter, I really focused on diving deep into the data, learning SQL, all that fun stuff, because we were using um, Google BigQuery and Looker. So it was essentially all just running very clearly on SQL. Um, And then I think the second quarter is when I really dug in with design. And then after that, front end and then back end and machine learning, not necessarily so rigid around the quarters, but seeking out, you know, books, resources, all those fun things. I was commuting down to Palo Alto on the Caltrain. So it gave me a lot of time to read, which was very nice. Um, The other thing I'll say is, you know, a huge portion of this was hands-on training and mentorship that I'm so grateful for. Um, Drew was a really amazing manager and made sure that I got up to speed, just taught me so much in those first few months and helped me connect with people in other parts of the organization to sort of train and mentor me in specific areas, like working with a specific designer on not just a feature, but being able to ask them questions about how they work um, and then working with uh, engineers who I could sort of ask the dumb questions to. I think, you know, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome, particularly women in tech. And I think the best explanation or feeling of it that I can sort of describe is when you're in a room and you have a question, but you're afraid to ask the question because you think that it might reveal a knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. And so you don't speak up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's a valid question and would be helpful for the conversation, but you're so afraid of being perceived as not having this knowledge that you don't want to necessarily ask it. So having like a safe person or a safe engineer where you're like, is this real? Like, why is this estimate so long? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Um, That was really helpful. And one of the things I realized through that exercise is most of the length of an estimation is not necessarily how hard it is in a vacuum, mm-hmm. it's how it's connected to other pieces of the architecture. So really getting like a system diagram of all of how all of the pieces of the puzzle fit together, mm-hmm. what APIs do what, how they're connected, what they require in terms of updates and security and all that fun stuff. Like that was really the unlock for me on the technical side is really understanding the architecture more. If you're a new PM, I really recommend get in a room with an engineer, ask them to draw you a diagram of how the whole system is put together. Not every engineer will be able to necessarily do that. Not every company has it well documented. But if you understand that, you will understand what drives the estimates. 
This also, I think, attributes to the willing of uh, looking for data in the places where no one wants to kind of like either update the current state of things or look into too many times. And impact of the AI and machine learning tools when it comes to the discovery phase, when it comes to the product attribution phase. Uh, I know you have experience with that. Can you please touch base on the subject? For those who don't know, Mercari is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace that allows you to sell items to other people. Um, it's essentially the Japanese version of eBay. It's a huge company in Japan. Uh, I was really fortunate to get to visit Japan at one point when I worked there uh, and also discover a lot of really obscure anime characters like Gudetama is, will be a lifelong obsession of mine. And if you don't know what it is, it's a apathetic egg yolk that's just given up. And yeah, it's really adorable and hilarious. So uh, if creative, you take one thing yeah. away from this mm -hmm. podcast, go Google Gudetama. Um, so Working at Mercari, one of the big challenges we had was UGC in, UGC out. So UGC listings, user-generated content, they're filling in the form themselves. There's a lot of user error. There, there's a lot of inconsistency. And then UGC search, right? So people input things into the query field. And again, like we would see examples of somebody searching for a brand name and using a period at the end or capitalizing or putting a space in a different place and the result set they would get back would be different. So that was a normal taking problem for us where, you know, if people are listing something with slightly different syntax, they're actually reducing the chance that their item is going to get sold because they're changing its appearance in search. So that was sort of one aspect. Another aspect of it was people searching for an item with certain attributes. We didn't have a great way of capturing it. So Mercari is a general marketplace. It has clothing, technology, home goods, like arts and crafts, handmade things, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. everything. The way that you list something really depends on the category it belongs to. Mm -hmm. So what I was working on was based on the brand and category of an item, could we then populate custom attribute fields for you to say, oh, I'm listing an iPhone, so I should be saying the model and I should be saying the size and, and all these things. And then right. mm -hmm. would we even have like specific values underneath that to be able to group so that if I'm searching for a specific model or a specific thing, I can then filter down. So for clothing, a lot of it was around cut or style of clothing where people wouldn't search jeans, they would search straight leg jeans. And we had no way of capturing that unless somebody had included it in the listing. And the amount of time somebody spent on a listing was pretty short. I don't remember it exactly off the top of my head, but people would do many listings at the same time. Like the most common path to starting a new listing was the CTA at the end of making another listing to do another one. Mm -hmm. So we were really focused on, from a seller experience, making it shortest distance possible A to B, and from a buyer experience, making the information as clear as possible so that you get the full set of search results that are most relevant to your query. The machine learning aspect of it helped kind of like get better insights into the actual problems, or did it also help in presenting the actual solution that might be applied. Yeah, so it was helping guess at, based on brand and category, what custom attribute fields needed to be in there. It was also taking those custom attributes and putting them into our search uh, taxonomy. And then also, um, towards the end, I was working on a project that was using computer vision to guess at the uh, category and subcategory of a piece of clothing based on the photo. So... Yeah. So then we were looking at, I remember like having a few meetings where we were looking at the confusion matrices and being like, oh, it's mixing up skinny and straight. And this makes sense that there's some error tolerance between these. And it's actually a lot harder when it's UGC photos. Like a lot of these models are trained off of stock images that you see with a model wearing it in good lighting versus if it's someone like taking a photo of something on their bed that's crumpled and, you know, has a background with stripes in it. And it's like, how do we know what's a piece of clothing and not? So uh, that was a pretty interesting application as well. I agree. And um, your journey with Aura, you're, you're a senior product manager uh, there now. And um, did your fresh perspective on 
uh, Aura was also a selling point for you to uh, be hired there? Or was this a situation entirely different? What was your experience like? So I came to Aura almost three years ago. My three-year anniversary is in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I was, I still am really passionate about health and wellness. It was sort of what I did in my free time when I wasn't working. So uh, I'm a yoga teacher. I've been doing that for about seven years and really passionate about health and fitness. And then when I started working at Mercari, I started thinking about, oh, well, I spent all this time training my body. What's the equivalent of a personal trainer for your brain? And that's when I read Why We Sleep by Matt Walker and realized, oh, I'm really missing this piece of the puzzle. So started looking into sleep as a way to improve my mental performance and cognition. Also was relevant because as I was scaling up the learning curve of becoming a product manager, I needed every possible brain cell firing. So I started wearing an aura ring, tracking my sleep, became obsessed with it. There are a few other people at the company at Mercari who started wearing them too. And we were comparing data and all that fun stuff and then started paying attention to their job listing site and eventually found a role there and was hired. My first conversation with them was a 45 minute one-on-one -on -one with the CEO at the time, Harpreet, who's really amazing. And I think what we really connected on was the vision of sleep is what personal training was, you know, 30 years ago, where we think of pillars of fitness as sort of all next to each other of exercise, nutrition, sleep, now more so mental well-being in the last couple of years has been uh, popping to the forefront more. But really what it is, is sleep is the foundation and everything else sits on top of it. And that's why I think Aura is a really powerful product. And I was you know, a user who's in love with it myself. So that really helped. So I essentially wanted to bring my product skills and then passion for fitness and wellness and then combine them. Whereas in my previous move, I was bringing my retail industry experience, but I didn't have the product skills. So I sort of did the hopscotch of like industry experience and skills and role as the two variables. In my first transition, I had industry experience, but not skills and role. So I was able to develop skills and role. And then in my second hop, I had skills in the role, but not the industry experience. So I think if you have one or the other, you can really lean on either and train in the other one. But have, not having both is where it gets a little bit tricky to transition. Yeah, it's all in the thinking and you should not be held back by the absence of something and view your strong points as a way to, you know, contribute to the role when it comes to product management and really anything. I wanted to ask you this question with regards to Aura being a Finnish-based company. You're working with a mm -hmm. remote team. Uh, how do you set up a predictable delivery there? Was it something that was already ongoing and you had to kind of like learn the process and understand why these things work? Or did you had a, had a chance to also um, put your uh, thinking into optimizing the development cycles? It's an imperfect process that we've been iterating at for three years. <laughs> so working cross-geo is hard. Fortunately, I had a little bit of previous experience at Mercari where I was working with engineers in Japan. So it's flipped where if you're working with people in Japan and the US, you're the late in the day person where you're in the late meetings versus working with Finland, it's a 10 hour time difference. So our 7 a.m. is there 5 p.m. So in California, our 7 a.m. is there 5 p.m. So I have some empathy for, you know, what it's like to be in meetings at the end of the day. We need to be really good at asynchronous communication and make sure that when we're showing up together in a room, we are 100% prepared and we know what we're going to talk about. We're not giving updates. We're having discussions. Mm -hmm. There have been other sort of, we do a retro every cycle. So we iterate on our process of how we work together every cycle. Um, I think taking that approach of like, we can't, change the laws of physics, but we can try to make it better. Every cycle has been serving us really well. Okay. And the other sort of main uh, wisdom that we've discovered is Slack is a bottomless pit of death. And mm. the more you communicate on Slack, the less happy everybody is. So mm. we try to be really strict about communicating on the project documents themselves. So Figma comments, Jira ticket comments, 
confluence pages that have multiple meeting notes recorded in sequence so that the sources for everything are in the clear place and the source of truth is always clear. That's like the ideal. Obviously we still use Slack for like, if something's unclear or we don't know whether there's a document for it or not, or that kind of stuff. Um, but basically I know that a project is going off the rails if I'm waking up to paragraphs on Slack every day. So that's mm-hmm. sort of like a, a warning flag or a barometer for me is how much time are we spending communicating on Slack? If we're spending too much time on Slack, that's a good indication that there's a little too much chaos in the project. I think the natural tendency of overusing the Slack came with the pandemic, obviously, where it was no like regular next to you person, the communication that you can talk to find out about the latest details and stuff. And uh, I think you're highlighting a very important aspect of the establishing the clearness of communication, considering that there are many people involved in this uh, and it means like completely different thing. Uh, from one person to another. With that thinking, how do you view OKRs and KPIs when it comes to improving the product? The person who really mentored and trained me, Drew, came from Google. So I sort of have the Google slant on OKRs of they are big, ambitious goals. And if you achieve 70% of an OKR, that's freaking amazing. So if we think of the high-level product strategy, I sort of back out of OKRs of, you know, how would we If we're thinking of things like retention, we need sort of a secondary layer of proxy metrics of, okay, we believe these projects are going to take the biggest bite out of the apple in terms of retention. So then it's OKRs that are sort of described along the lines of, well, what would success look like for this project? So Mm -hmm. I really hate uh, OKRs that are like, do this thing, like just ship it. Does it matter for the customer if we're just going on shipping it? So it's usually something along the lines of, you know, build this product so that we hit this KPI and it contains like by this time or within this amount of months. Um, That's sort of how I think of OKRs. KPIs, I think of more as on the feature level, how are we measuring success? So mm-hmm. they can be things that are more specific around percent of users that discover this, drop off or conversion rate within the funnel of the feature, and then whether it's doing what we think it will in terms of delivering retention. So if the high level company strategy is like the North Star, the OKRs are like the sort of second layer of proxy metrics. And then the KPIs are like the things we should be able to see on a feature per feature basis is at least how I think about it. There isn't one right way of doing it. So it really is up to you to figure out how it uh, works or not. But it's definitely very helpful to think of developing a feature as a hypothesis around if we do X, then we should see Y outcome in the data, because then you can recap the results at the end and say whether or not your hypothesis was true and why you think that. And that guides you to your next feature. And there is a such a fine line of leaning too much into, you know, doing OKRs and KPIs and it it becoming a sport because it's so easy to attribute them to the success metrics of APM. So just uh, being mindful about these things, these are just tools. Team empowerment versus mitigating problems. I think that uh, also speaks about more PMs want to less micromanage people, especially when it comes to remote teams. Everybody wants empowered teams so that um, PMs and everybody are focused on meaningful things instead of less meaningful things. Uh, What do you personally think about uh, this subject? Uh, How to go from mitigating everlasting ongoing problems that never end to team empowerment and, you know, being focused on more meaningful things? I mean, there's so many answers to this question. (laughs) Avoiding Slack, endless Slack threads is the number one energy vampire. Um, I think in terms of team empowerment, There's a lot of different ways, like if you were to ask different engineers, what makes you feel empowered? I think everybody would have a little bit of a different answer. And there's sort of different elements of it, depending on what aspect of product development you're talking about. I think one important thing for me is working style. So my belief is we will produce the best ideas if we collaborate. I don't think the PM should be coming up with all the solutions themselves. The solution should arise out of collaboration with the team. 
So when I start briefing a new feature, typically what I'll spec out is the problem and not the solution, and then bring that problem to both design and engineering at the same time. I think in a lot of companies, it's more like design comes in the fold, decides what it's going to be. And then by the time it gets to engineering, it's like, is it feasible or not? Right? Where there are a lot of really strong engineers that I work with who actually have strong views about the solutions and have things that they're interested in. And if I were to try to spec out all the ideas myself, they wouldn't be as good as if I brought it to the team and really got their view on it and we collaborated and worked together. Obviously hard in an asynchronous environment. Sometimes it requires one-off meetings where we talk about different solutions, a lot of Figma comments, but really I think being upfront with, here's the problem that I'm seeing and here's all the information that informs that problem, like the why and the context, that really helps us get off onto a foot of, okay, we're solving this issue together. In certain companies, you cannot help but work in silos and it's not necessarily PM's fault. You can do you know, certain things to try to mitigate this to the best ability possible, but ultimately, definitely collaboration provides better results, just a fact. And uh, some of the AI, maybe machine learning tools that you use in your day-to-day, -day, if we're not viewing it from the dystopian perspective of it taking over, but viewing it as a kind of like augmentation tool for a product manager, um, I think personally, it provides like an uncanny ab ability to tap into a problem, a domain that you don't necessarily know a lot about, and it could quickly um, kind of like guide you towards some of potential solutions that could be applied to a certain identified problem if you don't have a deep enough context of it. But what do you think about these uh, tools? How to use them? There's sort of two areas to think about here. One is application of these tools to your job as a product manager on a day-to-day -day basis. The yeah, other is application of these tools to the user experience to bring forward new features. So I think from a product manager day-to-day -day perspective, you know, it's interesting as a sounding board. I don't know if it'll ever really replace sort of the experience and the context of talking to somebody who knows the product inside and out the way somebody who works at the company does. Um, I know a lot of people are really excited about these tools as a way to prototype, I think that's more interesting of could you use it as an assistant to help you write code so that the product manager can now make prototypes and articulate ideas in demos mm -hmm. versus just in words. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a way to like, instead of wireframing or learning Figma is using, are using these tools a way to take sort of that process one step further of being able to make uh, prototypes as a product manager. I think that's really interesting, especially as a non-technical PM, uh, could I ask it to write some code for me to, to demonstrate something? I don't think it would ever be able to write a feature that we put in because obviously there's all the uh, uniqueness of our code base and it needs to fit with our standards. But as a way to create prototypes, I think it's potentially really interesting and opens up uh, the ability to hack to product managers more so. The prototyping example is a strong one. This could definitely accelerate the process and remove uh, time that otherwise people would have spent creating a prototype. Um, Laura, totally. thank you very much for being a part of this episode. This was Laura Furman uh, with uh, Aura Ring. Uh, I was your host, Daniel, the Scare Minds podcast. Thank you very much for your time. See ya. Thank you. You've been watching another episode of the Care Minds podcast. Hit the like if you like this episode and drop us a comment below. We'd be excited to hear which topic in health tech product management realm we should cover next. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell notification. This helps the channel to produce more content like this. See you soon at Care Minds.